So, uh, I'm going to start with Tina. Um, I'm, I'm trying to practice my stance here. Someone gave me the brief for running these things. You need to tread the line between Paxman and Norton. <laughs> so, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so, Tina, I'll start with a big one. Uh, tell us about Tone of Voice at Santander. Great, OK. Um, well, thanks very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to come and talk to everybody here today because um, it's one of my favourite subjects, so it wasn't a difficult uh, question when you... When it wasn't a difficult answer, I should say, when you said, will you come along? So, uh, Santander and Tone of Voice was a journey that really started back in 2013 um, when our then-CEO, Anna Botin, uh, issued a challenge to everybody who worked in the bank and said, I want everybody here, please, to make a personal commitment to how they will more simple, personal and fair. And what a brilliant question to be asked because it was not only a really easy one for me to answer, but actually we had everybody in the organisation thinking about the same thing right from the very top. So that started with our executive committee where every single member of the committee made their personal commitments and everybody else in the organisation was expected to do the same. So I was like, well... I think I know the answer to this question. I'm going to work really hard to try and get a tone of voice defined that will make the way that we communicate with each other and the way that we're communicating with our customers in particular more simple personal fare. So really, that's how it all, all came about. And what did that mean? What did you actually do? What did we do? Well, to, we're a marketing team. I work in a, in a wider marketing team. So we did what marketing teams always do, which was write a brief because that's the best way to start. So, so we had to think about, you know, what is it here that we want to achieve? What we wanted was a really clearly defined tone of voice and a set of guidelines that were truly actionable. We're a big organisation. There's 20,000 of us in the UK. Um, and we knew that there were people writing in different pockets all across the organisation. So we needed a way of reaching them with a really consistent message. So we need those guidelines documented. But importantly, we also needed material, support material, that would allow initially us to deliver some training with the support of the writer, but actually moving forward to do it on our own. Um, so we wanted those support materials as well. And, and then the other thing that we were really keen on was making sure that we had the right level of engagement of people across the organisation right from the outset. And that included our senior managers. So we were very confident that we were going to get a positive response because we knew we had all of our senior managers thinking about what they were going to do to make our bank more simple, personal, fair. And we knew that, therefore, we had the opportunity to get them to endorse the work that we were doing and champion it with their teams. So we wanted them engaged from the outset. But we also wanted the people that we knew would be responsible for actually making it happen engaged so they had an opportunity to, to tell us what they thought a tone of voice should feel like um, and had the opportunity to influence it. So felt that they'd had some collaboration in the process because, obviously... People who collaborate are much more likely to want to champion it moving forward. So, um, so that was that was the kind of second key thing that we, we were the, sorry the third key thing that we documented in the brief. From there, it was <coughs> who, well, who do we want to work with? And and we were keen to work with an agency that wasn't just really good with words, um, and the writer undoubtedly are very good with words, but uh, but also an agency that had some experience of delivering change in big organisations and getting tone of voices really embedded in an organisation. It's, it's relatively easy to define a tone of voice if you know what you want to sound like. Actually, what's much more difficult is getting everybody to use it. So we wanted somebody who could help us with that and, and perhaps give us an idea of what some of the mistakes are that we could try and avoid and those sorts of things. So, so that took us to the stage of, um, of reaching out to the writer and, and starting to talk to, to those guys and, and get them on board. Um, and from then, it was that, that we went back then to that engagement piece and, and collaboratively, but led by the writer, we undertook a series of interviews with um, senior managers across the organisation. We asked them all sorts of questions. We asked them what they thought about the way that Santander was communicating at the moment, if they thought there was anything good about it, if there was anything particularly bad about it, um, what they thought we should be sounding like, um, and we also ran a series of workshops with the people that would be responsible, ultimately, for helping us bring it to life once we'd got it defined. So that really allowed us to tick that box of making sure that people had had the opportunity to influence right at the outset, before we'd even defined the language, so that they felt that their perspectives were being taken into account. 
and you said, sorry, to you said at the beginning, so you'd had this brief about simple personal fare, mm. and clearly they all had an interest in making that happen. Were they particularly bothered about language as a way of doing that, or was that just your hobby horse? Um, some more than others, I suppose, is the <coughs> honest, honest answer. Um, there are definitely lots of teams across, so, you know, as is the case with lots of big organisations, you've, you've got marketing functions who are writing all of the time, and those guys are then they're great at what they do, they're comms specialists. And, and for them, it was just about, it would be really good to make sure that we're being more consistent than we're perhaps being up to now. I think it was the pockets of teams that knew that they had responsibility for communicating with customers in an operational sense that really started to go, well, actually, this could really help us because we, we write letters, but we don't have any rules to follow. So we just do what we think is right. And, and inevitably, what that meant is that one team was doing this and another team was doing something quite different. And, and of course, from a customer perspective, if you're getting both of those communications, it's feeling really quite inconsistent. So quite a lot of people did recognise. And then there were others that were kind of like, well, it's, it's fine. Everything's fine at the moment. Do we need to fix it? So you needed to work harder, obviously, with those people to get them to understand what the benefits could be. And how did you do that? So we did um, a series of different things. We started with, um, so, I mean, obviously once we got the guidelines um, all defined, we, we communicated them outwards and we did that in a number of different ways. Um, but the important thing for us, or the, the most important thing we did first was we, we sent them back to all of those senior managers, got some great feedback from them, which was good, but then asked them to share them with their team. So it didn't just come from marketing and it didn't just come from brand. It came from our senior leaders across the organisation. And we specifically said, please share them with your teams. And if you believe in them, if you, if you believe they're as, as good as we think they are in terms of a set of guidelines for tone of voice, please endorse them with your teams, um, which um, it, they did 100%. So, so that was really helpful from our perspective. We obviously then pushed out lots of central communication using the usual channels that big organisations would have. So we had lots of intranet news stories and we made sure the guides were available in, in central locations so everybody could get to them. But the other really important thing was um, identifying champions across the organisation. And again, we got those senior managers to nominate people in their teams to be champions for the language. Um, and and that's, that's an important point again, because they were nominated by their senior managers. It, it was a, a message there that their teams thought it was important. It wasn't just marketing who thought it was important to make this happen. Um, and we spent a lot of time with those champions, um, with the writer. We, we did special training sessions for them and produced additional materials for them so that they could go away and be our voice out into the organisation because there's, there's me and there's two people in my team and there's 20,000 people, so it's not possible for us to speak to everybody every day, um, as you can imagine. So we needed people that would reinforce the message for us. Um, and I think what was important for those champions was making sure that they understood that it wasn't just, <clears throat> you know, every time somebody writes something, they've got to come and check it with you. And, and if it's wrong, you've got to rewrite it. Well, of course, that can't work. They've got jobs to do. So it was about giving them the skill set to understand what types of questions they needed to ask of people who had been writing to get them to realise where they might be going wrong in terms of implementing the tone um, and where they were getting things right and giving them the positive um, reassurance. And we also gave them... Um, some, some tips and techniques, if you like, to, to deal with sceptics. So we'd, we'd thought about what might be all of the kind of questions that people will ask and, or, or challenge us on and, and give them the, the confidence to deal with those. And who were your sceptics? Is, um, is there a pattern? <clears throat> Some of these people might have sceptics in their own organisation. You know, we, we were so fortunate, really, because the timing was just brilliant. I mean, as I said, I've described this kind of groundswell of activity within our organisation around simple personal fare. Um, and a huge change that was, that was happening throughout the organisation in our culture. And everybody was just, and still, I would say, is very open to, to hearing more about what can we do to make our business more simple personal fare. And I'm not for one minute suggesting that Santander has reached the end of that journey. It hasn't, but there's still a lot more that we can do. But everybody understood that if you can be more simple personal fare, it had to be good for customers because, you know, who wants you to be complicated in personal and unfair? It, it's, you know, it's great to have something that is really quite hard, quite hard to challenge. So we didn't have many sceptics. Um, and where we did, it was probably about much more specific issues. So where we were talking about, well, we think that 
you know, to talk personally means that we don't really have to adopt that very formal 1960s telephone voice, which, um, which people sort of suddenly seem to start doing when they write business letters. It's, it's, a, it's a funny phenomenon. Um, uh, and, and that we could use much more natural language and we could write things as we say them. And, and there were some, some nervousness amongst people, oh, well, we have to sound very professional. And, you know, so we had the conversations around, well, if things are clearer and easier to understand, then actually they are more professional communication. Let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. We should respect the fact that our customers lead very busy lives. They've got all sorts of different things going on. Finances for them is, is very necessary to allowing them to run their life, but it shouldn't take up any more time than it absolutely needs to. So, you know, my perspective has always been the case that they should never have to read a letter that's longer than it absolutely has to be, and it should certainly be nice and clear and easy for them to understand. I don't want them to have to read it three times to understand what we're trying to tell them. So we were largely able to overcome sceptics mm -hmm. in, in that context. And give us a sense of the time. Like, how long ago did you start, and when did you start to see it having an impact? And what are you doing now? What are we doing now? So um, it started for us sort of uh, just after, I, I guess, it, mid-2013, after that challenge, and we'd all thought about what we were doing and submitted our ideas and those kind of things. Um, we had the language pretty much defined and rolled out to the business early in 2014. Um, we did a lot of training early on, which probably took us through most of Q1. Um, and, and actually, the key thing that we've done... To, because one of, one of your questions, and it's a really good question, is how do you make it, how do you make it stick? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think it's how you make it stick, it's how do you keep making sure it's sticking? It, it never goes away, this, because organisations are big and they're fluid and people change and they move in and out of roles and they leave and new people start. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to keep reminding people about what you're doing. Um, so we've, we've just, I suppose, tried to inject more formality into some of the process of comms that are going from teams that aren't necessarily comms specialists. Um, and that's probably been the key thing that's allowed us to keep the momentum. So within our organisation now, any customer communication from any team has to come through my team for brand approval. And that does create work, clearly, <laughs> but we think it's worth it because what it allows us to do is quickly identify the teams that have just got it. Because you see the letters, you go, great, it's approved, no problems at all. Um, so you know which teams are working well, so you can go back to the champions in those areas and find out what they're doing and then get them to share that with other champions in other areas because, you know, they've obviously cracked it. Um, but what also it allows you to do is spot the areas that are clearly struggling a little bit more. So when you see letters and go, hmm, that, that doesn't feel quite right, it's, it's a nice easy way of us being able to identify that we've got to either go and do a little bit more training or go and find out. And, you know, sometimes we go and we find out what the champion who we trained has left but didn't tell us. You know, that happens. Um, so we go back in and, well, should we find you another champion? You know, start the process again. So that's, a, that's an important mm. part. So, you know, the, the time frame... It doesn't finish for me. <laughs> you kind of keep going. I guess, to begin with, you get that sort of typical, quite steep curve as more people are learning, um, and, and then it sort of tails off, but you just have to, keep, you have to keep talking about it. So two and a half years on from the big push, mm. then, how much, what percentage of your team's work is this? Um... This is when you can terrify the audience. No, I don't think I'm going to terrify the audience, actually. I mean, I do have somebody in my... I have one person in my team who is largely dedicated to reviewing language on material. But, but she doesn't do everything reactively. You know, she's, she's doing stuff proactively herself. So we, we still respond with... The, the writer did some fantastic um, presentation material for us in the early days, and we still use that presentation material, and she'll go out and talk to different teams um, in different parts of the country, so she'll spend time doing that as well. So she's not just sitting there, you know, constantly going through emails and, and reviewing things. Yeah. But, but we think it's important, and I think, for a, a, an organisation our size to have one person whose job is just to be working with the organisation about, um, about tone of voice is, is not excessive at all. And to answer the big question that's floating above your head. Mm. How have you measured whether it's working, either with customers or in the outside world? Well, we've, if this is probably the one area where we might and probably should have done more early on. But actually, 
When we started to investigate before we did the tone of voice whether or not we had specific volumes of complaints around letter writing, what we found is actually it was never captured that way. And I think generally it was more likely to be captured in association with the, the, the topic that was the issue. And, and undoubtedly in the past, we will have responded to complaints in a way that will have exacerbated the original problem because we didn't make it clear enough or the communication was, I don't know, confusing, whatever it might have been. Um, but it wasn't captured that way. So it wasn't possible for us to say, set ourselves a target and say, right, we want to reduce complaints from here to here and be absolutely confident it was about the tone of voice. We did, however, do um, quite a lot of qualitative research early on. So we took existing communications with customers and we rewrote them and we put them through qualitative research and we showed people the existing letters and we showed them the, the other letters and kind of it was a robust research methodology around it. Sometimes you did it the other way around and got people's feedback about what's working most strongly. And, and thankfully, universally, they liked the, uh, the, uh, the rewritten versions in the new tone of voice. Yes, <laughs> we were relieved too. Uh, so we had the kind of qualitative evidence. And then for us, it's really more about, because, because we have this approval process running throughout, throughout the team, we have a good understanding, as I've said earlier, where it's working well in our organization and where we need to do more work. And what are you most proud of? What I'm most proud of is when teams come to you. I mean, the, the, I guess there's two things. I had more emails than I can count when we, after we'd done the training from people saying that it was categorically by far and away the best training they'd ever had in their time <coughs> at Santander. And I don't want you to think we do terrible training at Santander. We don't. <laughs> we don't at all. So the benchmark was already quite high. Um, so, uh, so, so, that, so that was great. And I was really proud of that, that we'd actually managed to get people to feel engaged and passionate about language in a way that I feel engaged and passionate about it. But then, you know, it's my job too. So it's, it's, and were you so forcing people to do that training? Or were they being picked because they were going to be enthusiastic? Uh, no, we weren't. Forcing, well, you can't force anybody to do anything, can you, really? I mean, you can invite, but they don't always turn up. Um, and, you know, there were cases where people didn't turn up and we'd have to follow up other ways, but... I mean, <laughs> Sounds but, menacing. Yeah, <laughs> get, get them eventually. We find them eventually in the organisation. But as I said earlier, a lot of these people have been nominated by senior managers across the organisation, so they were kind of thinking, oh, OK, people think this is important, this is something we should be doing. So we had more buy-in, I think, mm. at the outset. So I'm proud of that. But I'm also very proud of the fact that we've had teams now absorb that, or absorb the, the tone of voice and, and the support materials that we've given them, and then come back to us and say, we've got 200 operational letters, and actually what we're going to do now is an end-to-end -end process review. We're going to have a look at what that process is that supports and what, where, where that letter fits in that, and we're going to rewrite them all. And they have, and that's brilliant. That, you know, that's fantastic that off their own back these teams are, are looking in and saying we can make these things better. It's not to say they were dreadful to begin with, but we can make them better. And, and of course, what it means is that they're clearly more aligned to the overall tone. And anything that you haven't cracked, that you're sitting there going, I want to get my hands on that. Yeah, I think we, the, 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 the role of champions, and I think, um, I think Harry will talk of ambassadors, I think you've heard refer to it, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, I think they are key, and I think for us we've probably underestimated, and it's entirely our fault because the writer did warn us, that it, there's more work involved in maintaining a group of, of champions than, than we'd, we'd, we'd kind of allowed for. Um, and, and I think that's something we need to think about moving forward, is how we continue to give those guys the support that they need and, and keep re-engaging with them and asking them the questions and giving them the opportunity to say, oh, you know, I've been finding this is more of a problem, see what other support we can give them. Um, but also trying to find more ways to get them engaging with each other rather than just with us. Um, so I think that would be the bit that we've not cracked yet. We can do better mm -hmm. on that. Great. Maybe I'll take a couple of questions for Tina before we hear from Harry. If anyone is ready and poised. One right next to the mic. Brilliant. Well done. Um, you mentioned giving tips and techniques to deal with sceptics. Um, I've been writing for sort of over... 10 years now and I still come up against sceptics and I still go shit how do I deal with this <laughs> so I haven't I, I don't know the answer but yeah could you give us maybe one or two techniques on how your team deal with sceptics when it comes to quite subjective stuff to do with tone perhaps yeah I mean it, 
It is quite difficult because it kind of depends sometimes on, on the subject matter in, in question. So what we did was have a, a really good brainstorm about what are the likely things people might challenge us on. Um, and in, in our world of financial services, we, we kind of felt that, I mean, obviously we have very different audiences. We have retail audiences and we have corporate audiences and some of our corporates are really big clients. Um, and we, we anticipated that where we were saying, you know, you can talk more personally, you can say it, you, you can write it like you say it, that there might be some challenge around that. Um, and we were right, there was some challenge around that. And I think the important thing was getting uh, people to understand that using a less formal language doesn't need to make you less professional. And, and getting rid of jargon doesn't mean that you can't use technical language if that technical language is appropriate for your audience. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we were very keen to say, you know, jargon, and I'm sure most big organisations or, or even some small organisations like this, we, we live and breathe the work that we do every day and, and we create these wonderful acronyms that mean everything they need to mean to us and you sort of forget that they don't actually mean anything to anybody else. Um, and it was reminding people of those sorts of things that we, we found most useful. You're still having a fight about the word sorry, aren't you? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> not, not, not with most people, but yeah, some, some people have been very kind of like, oh, I don't know if we should say I'm sorry, shouldn't we say I apologise? <laughs> can I follow up? What, what is your verdict on that? Because I had that exact feedback <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> I was told we should never apologise. Um, we shouldn't say the word sorry, which I, I didn't really um, buy. But um, So it sounds like there's an interesting thing. Is that about never even... Admitting that you've done something wrong. Yes, so okay. it wasn't it wasn't a choice between sorry and we apologise. Okay. It was literally don't say sorry. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. My my, <laughs> my personal view is, if you've made a mistake, you should say sorry. Yeah, <laughs> that was my view. It was vetoed. But <laughs> <laughs> but I said sorry. Well, well done. <laughs> uh, is there another question for Tina right now? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I wondered how much of the guidelines that you've set are uh, about principles. So you've said avoiding jargon, for example, and how much is about character. So a sort of character that gives personality to the brand that everyone can use. And I wondered whether that's a trickier side of it. Is it you know, no jargon is a rule, but other ways might be an interpretation or use of language. Yeah, and that's, a, that's an excellent question. And I think it is fair to say that our tone of voice around simple personal fare is more built in a series of principles at the moment, more than it was designed to give us a very unique sound. Um, and, and that's partly because as, as a bank, we recognise that we had a lot of work to do to, um, to, to become more simple personal fare. We'd, we'd been through um, a, a history of having acquired other banks, having migrated customers, having you know, all sorts of different things, three different banks really coming together. Um, and that creates behind the scenes quite um, a lot of work, as you could imagine, to re-engineer process. And, and over a period of time, it meant that maybe the experience for customers hasn't been as good as it needed to be. Um, and there was a wider context as well for financial services. Um, you know, the, the financial crisis back in sort of 2008 is, is still very, um, very high in people's memories. And, and we felt it was important that we didn't try to push our tone to a stage, you know, we're not innocent smoothie, we shouldn't sound irreverent, we do have to sound professional, but you can do that in a way that doesn't need to sound terribly formal. So I think your observation is a good one. I think our tone of voice is more, at the moment, rooted in a series of principles that basically makes us sound more simple, more personal, like we are talking to a person, not to, you know, just anybody, um, and, and a bit fairer. So, from one much-loved industry, financial <laughs> services, to another, let's talk about energy. <laughs> Shall we, Harry? Um, so, as I said, Harry has now moved to a job that allows him to play football at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, we've noticed. Um, but tell us about Tone of Voice at British Gas. How, how much of what Tina said is the same and how much is different? Hello, everyone. Um, it's very similar, but I'm slightly jealous of Tina getting such clear direction from the top on simple personal affair. Unfortunately, at British Gas, we reacted to um, our reputation hitting an all-time low. Um, 
which is, I'm sure, for a lot of you, quite hard to believe with a company like British Gas. <laughs> um, but a few years ago, we had raised prices again for, I think, the third or fourth consecutive year. Then we'd had a PR disaster with our customer service director on Twitter, where he did a Ask Bert um, a series of questions, which couldn't have gone worse. Uh, <laughs> the, the questions he got from customers weren't very good. And How we left <laughs> British Gas? Who knows this? <laughs> and then we went um, above the line the week after with a big campaign about how we were helping customers. Um, and the two just didn't go together very well. Um, so all of a sudden, as a brand, we had to completely reposition ourselves, um, work out how we were going to approach the next three to five years, completely redefine the brand and working in the brand strategy team at the time. It was an exciting time to be able to rebuild um, a 200 year old institution's reputation. Um, so we focused on the usual, you know, what is our identity going to be? Um, what is our brand positioning? Um, and we seemed to land on um, a positioning around simplicity. Um, and that was needed. It wasn't, I wouldn't say it would be a 20 year strategy. It would be a short term as we turned ourselves around and stopped being this incredibly complicated energy company. Um, but instead a brand that was easy to deal with and customers actually wanted to come to. Gas is the same everywhere. You don't get special gas from a particular, a particular company. So you have to stand out in a very busy, crowded market. Um, and for the first time, we actually set ourselves out, set the stall out to look at language, which we hadn't done before. We did have a 50-page verbal identity document, which was all about <laughs> style and how to use commas and how to use bullets, um, which the, the irony in a verbal identity document that's quite hard to follow um, really doesn't help. And, and I'm not, I'm not going to keep up this very critical tone, I, I promise. Um, no, do. It's, it's working. It's entertaining. <laughs> yeah, I'll get some nasty emails after. Um, but yeah, so we, we, very similar to Tina, we uh, went to the business. We went to the key influencers at different parts of our business and asked them, what does tone of voice mean to you? So um, it was very different to how our social media team were interacting with customers versus what our executive complaints team uh, were doing versus what our customer comms team were doing had a slightly different tone to what our marketing team was doing. Different copywriters um, at different agencies at different parts of the business working to no real tone of voice guidelines. Um, as a result, we were just incredibly inconsistent. So um, we reached out to the writer around that time. Um, they helped us coordinate these sessions around the business. Uh, we took in everyone's needs, everyone's hopes, everyone's fears. Um, a lot of the fears were very similar in that we didn't want to, we didn't want to go too uh, informal if we kicked off a tone of voice program, which is amazing. You will hear the same thing at every big organization. The same big fear is that we're going to start sounding like innocent, which is never what the brief is. Um, so we took all of that, we turned it into a huge brief. Um, we were working on our brand strategy at the same time when we landed on uh, three personality traits of being in tune, down to earth and pioneering which moved us away from the 10 personality traits we had before, which was <laughs> caring, helpful, British leader, just all the same wishy-washy terms that had got us into the position we were in, raising prices without considering the customer, um, and then going away with big marketing campaigns that just weren't reflective of a great working culture that we had internally at BG. Um, so we turned that into a huge brief. Uh, we gave the right of our um, uh, personality traits um, and then we give them a ton of writing from the business. So internal writing, corporate writing, business writing, um, customer comms, pages from the website. We just had so much copy that we wanted someone to, to help us look at. And we provided them with the pages that we thought were the, were the most embodied the problems that we had with tone of voice. Um, so we went away, the writer spent some time looking at it, they presented back, um, again a huge deck if I remember, you really like big decks at the writer. Um, <laughs> um, uh, he gives with one hand and he takes away. But it was really great, it was, you know, the, the penny really dropped when we're, we're being shown um, the writing as it is now, which hadn't been looked at for so many years. 200 year old company and I don't think it had ever properly focused on tone of voice. Can um, I just, can I ask you about that? Yes. Cause, cause when, <laughs> thanks Sarah. Because when you said, you, you know, they were, you were looking at the brand as a whole and you said we did the usual, we looked at identity. We looked, how did tone of voice even get onto the agenda at that point? Why was anyone taking it seriously? Um, so collectively we had people in the team who'd done it before. Um, someone who'd worked at O2. Um, someone who had seen it uh, happen at other brands she was working with as a consultant. Um, but yeah, that was, the, that was the 
light bulb moment to say, why don't we focus on this? We haven't before. And why don't we as a brand team take the power and, and give, it the, <coughs> give it the focus it needed rather than just relying on our great copywriters internally who are doing a great job, but were so um, engrossed in writing day in, day out, they weren't able to take a step back and just say, what does the brand actually want us to speak like? Um, so yeah, that, that's how, we ca how it came about. Um, so yeah, seeing the before, seeing the after, uh, it was exciting. All of a sudden, we're getting this really normal way of writing that we could get excited about. So we presented it back to the working group who we'd uh, got the thoughts from initially. Um, they were all excited, a little bit tentative, um, a little, some slight pessimism again in that worry of have we gone too far um, with some of, these, some of this writing. We defined some principles. And just to, to go back to the question about um, tone and uh, how how our brand personality should be portrayed in guidelines versus principles. We created principles that we thought were very reflective of that individual personality trait. So structuring your letter carefully, we just thought it was all about being in tune with our reader and actually um, framing the copy in a way that they'd want to write. So we, we really felt that they went together, so your principles were your personality. Um, and then we created some comms, so we created some letters. We created some um, new pages for the website. Um, we had a look at them, we liked them, we then put them into research, uh, which British Gas loves research, which is good and a bad thing, but in this uh, respect it was really, really good. We sat down with corporates, small businesses, medium-sized enterprises, huge corporates, uh, young people, middle-aged people, older people, uh, set them into groups and asked them, again, it was all, the focus was all about brand personality, we asked them to characterise British Gas as a human being. Um, if they were in this room now, what would they look like? And it was all the same answer from everyone. Uh, loose fitting suit, quite old, very corporate. Um, <laughs> which you don't want to hear, but it also helps validate the work you're about to show them. Um, so then we showed them the old writing and it really reflected that human being that they just characterised to us. Um, some people thought the writing was okay. Uh, instantly thought, yeah, this is how I'd expect to be spoken to by an energy company. Uh, the formal language. Uh, we felt it was quite complicated, but they, they didn't. They were just focusing on the tone of voice. Then all of a sudden, we put the new style of writing in front of them. And lo and behold, everyone loved it. Um, it spoke to them as they wanted to be spoken to. And that was the people who just told us that the formal way, the old way of writing, was how they'd want to be spoken to. So suddenly, you're putting this new style of writing in front of them, and they've gone, oh, actually, no, that's how I want to be spoken to. So again, it's a light bulb moment for the customers as much as it is for us because I think they've been, they've been sent so many comms over time and programmed to read writing from businesses in a certain way that sometimes you need to unlock that for them and, and show them how um, brilliant business writing can actually, can actually um, look. Um, we had pushed things a little bit too far, so we had gone a bit too strong on some metaphors or... Um, uh, some examples of where to find your meter. I think we got some strong feedback on that. Padders will remember that one about searching in dark cubby holes for your meter. Um, some corporates really didn't like that one. So, uh, uh, but again, that was the point in the research that allowed us to just rein in some of the language and find out what our place was. So how should British Gas write? Here's how we think it should write. Okay, you don't agree with that, so we'll rein it back in. Um, and then we had our guidelines. Uh, we put all of that feedback um, we put all of the lessons we'd learned when we were, when we were looking, um, when we were auditing uh, our current comms, and we put it into a really punchy, uh, really easy to read guidelines document that we then circulated internally in the business, got our sign off, and then we trained as many people as we could in a period of about three to four months. I think we trained 400 people in that time. Um, trained all of our marketing teams, internal teams, corporate teams, anyone who wanted to be trained. Uh, and then we relied on our word of mouth to really spread and teams started coming to us. Then we branded those guidelines up. We started creating um, specific guidelines that drew out certain principles that people wanted to know more of. Uh, we had, uh, and some of you I'm sure know this technique of know, feel, do, or think, feel, do. Um, that really, really resonated with people in the training. We said to, said to um, colleagues, what does your reader want to know? How do you want them to feel and what do you need them to do? If you can't answer any of those questions, then the writing isn't up to scratch. And you're looking for those levers you can pull to get people really <coughs> engaged and get them to really um, uh, become an ambassador, become a champion for the program. And that was our, 
That was our lever. So we created guidelines all around no field do, and we circulated them, and that meant anyone who was doing their comms, anyone who was about to send it to their manager for approval, if they couldn't answer those questions, then they would get some uh, slightly negative feedback back from the manager about the, read, uh, about the writing, so I'm helping them at the same time. Um, then it was about creating guidelines specific to certain areas of the business. So here's the big 40-page um, tone of voice guidelines document, but is that really perfect for digital um, and how we should be writing on our new website? Yes, the principles are generally the same, but how can I make those principles more specific to what I need? So we created guidelines, shorter um, uh, bite-sized guidelines for those individual parts of the business. Then after that, it became an embedded program where we'd have one session every month. Um, and then we'd have specific sessions for teams around the country who wanted um, the tone of voice training. Um, again, some of the feedback, best training I've ever had. Um, some skeptics, again, which we followed similar techniques of, of getting, getting them on board. Um, the same old questions about starting sentences with conjunctions and starting it with and, which is the, the bane of everyone's <laughs> life. But you, I genuinely believe you could have the same people sat up here on the stage who have gone through the same tone of voice program, work with the writer, and they'd all have the very same positive things to say about the program because it, it works, it completely works. So this became quite a big part of your life, Harry, didn't it? It did, yes. So it, why, like, why did you get excited about it? I think people talk brand, and um, people who don't know much about brand think it's all about a colour palette and some logos, um, and they, they just completely overlook the fact that language is the brand as well. Um, and as you walk around the buildings in British Gas and you're looking at notices above printers um, telling you this really convoluted way about what's going to happen to get the printer <laughs> fixed. Um, and the same if you go in, there's a, a notice outside the toilet. You're constantly being shown language that is just far too over the top. Um, and you can't fix that with a logo change or a colour palette change. You can fix it with the right brand strategy, the right positioning and the right language. Um, so I really saw the power of it, and I was guilty of overlooking it before. Um, I'd always written in that way that would just make me look good to my peers. Okay, does this actually, is this good bit of writing? Are you happy with it? Okay, let's get it out. Not considering the customer first. Once I saw that power, I just had so much enthusiasm for it. Um, and you can take that into any role. I saw anyone who was working in the call centre writing complaints letters all of a sudden found a way that they could build the British Gas brand, whereas previously, those guys can't work on a big um, above the line um, TV campaign. They can't create a new brand strategy. The only ways they can help to really build the brand are the way they write and the way to speak to customers. And they speak to customers in a fantastic way. They have really nice down to earth conversations with them on the phone. Why can't they reflect that in their writing as well? And Tone of Voice gave me the opportunity to actually let them do that. So that's why I just, that's why I became such a big part of my life because I, I was very passionate about it. In Staines, Harry is known as Tony Voice. Yeah. <laughs> you too can be Tony Voice. <laughs> uh, and is it working? Is it having an effect? Yes, it is. Um, Good, stop that. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it works in, in various ways, so it isn't just about um, fixing a problem. Um, internally, you can reflect on uh, how much time you're going to save certain teams. Uh, we got one customer journey in British Gas Business, which was I think it was topped out between 49 and 51,000 words in this journey, including terms and conditions and everything else. Um, we took a step back and looked at the journey as it should be and got it down to 17,000 words. That tells you just how much guff was circulating in those letters that no one was reading. Um, so that's a big win. You're saving time, you're saving money on printing, you're saving money on reading, on checking, all of those things. Um, then you start taking customer journeys that people just take for granted. So a big part of um, working in energy when you've got people paying by cash or cheque is debt. Um, now, no one can get too excited about uh, transforming a debt customer journey. <laughs> um, but from doing tone of voice, we got people in our customer comms team really excited about being able to turn around um, the debt journey and actually getting more money back, getting more customers calling up and paying off their debts being really clear, using a language in a way that just told the customer what they needed to do, um, when they needed to do it by, and why they were getting this letter, and being less harsh, not using quite a um, very formal striking language to get them to, um, and, and thinking that that's going to get the customer to call up. 
Instead, if you just use simple language that is really clear on what they need to do, you get more of a response. I've since left when those results came through, but Marianne can tell you a little bit about it in a bit. Um, and then there's also the customer feedback, um, and then there's the internal feedback. So customers uh, told us in the research that they really liked our writing. Um, and if we ever had to deal with skeptics or people objecting to the way we were writing, we could always refer back to what we knew, what we'd been told by customers. This is how we are supposed to be writing. This is how modern brands write. And this is your opinion against that. Um, so I always sided with the research that we had. And um, just before we go to the floor, same question. Uh, what are you proud of? And then what is the stuff that you're still like, oh? Um, so I'm most proud of probably that something like the debt journey, where we actually got so many people enthused and um, we actually turned a, a terrible journey into something really great. Um, so that same approach to that one journey is being rolled out across loads of others because they've seen the effect. So I think I'm most proud of that objective approach to looking at customer journeys rather than just individual bits of writing. Um, and I'm most enthused about the, the fact that we did brand by stealth. So you know, huge culture change programs that get um, introduced into companies and British Gas had so many values, it had so many priorities that were constantly being um, uh, pushed upon people who were all over the walls, yet most people seem to really get on board with our brand personality. They identified with it far, far more. Uh, and we built this culture of people who wanted to be in tune, wanted to be down to earth, wanted to reflect that in their writing. So much so that they neglected, well not neglected, but overlooked slightly some of the values which were just telling them how they should behave anyway. So telling someone to um, deliver great service, which is one of the, the values. People can't get excited about that. That's what they've always wanted to do. That's why they work in the operation. That's why they speak to the customers every day is to deliver great service. How we facilitate um, a culture that allows them to do that is the brand personality. And I think I'm most proud of the fact that Tone of Voice was a huge culture change program that we got, um, that we, that we got instead of spending millions upon millions, and we did it by stealth. And did people know it was a culture change program when they started? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, and then, sorry, Tim. I'm just going to say, if, if I'm allowed to, cool. just make an observation. Um, I, I agree with you, it might be difficult to get people enthused and excited about a debt journey, but actually, it's those moments in time when our customers are most vulnerable that yeah. you have the biggest opportunity um, to, to turn them into a proper, true advocate of your brand. And you will never achieve that if, when they're in those circumstances, whether that is debt, whether it's a situation where somebody's passed away and accounts are in probate, for example, in our case, or, or you know, you know, whatever it might be, or, or a real difficult complaint, if you can influence the way that that customer is managed through the process with a tone of voice that means that whatever communication we issue to them, they properly understand at a time where they might be less well able to understand mm -hmm. things because of what's going on in their lives, then you know, you've, you've kind of got it made. That's, mm -hmm. that's the time when it's really important, much more so than you know, your latest marketing <coughs> campaign you're pushing out. That's not to say that should sound completely different. Of course it shouldn't. But... Um, it's, those, it's those moments in truth, of truth in people's lives where we have a real obligation, I think, mm -hmm. um, to get things right for our customers. Yeah. This is what I mean about brand by stealth and culture change. Um, the, we had such a focus on NPS and, and driving on our NPS goal, and it always seemed to be that the only way we do that is what our next campaign would be and how we're next going to sell the face of our business. And to put it, for want of a better uh, term, it's the less sexy stuff that does that, that builds the brand and helps you build your, um, your customer sentiment, your, um, your MPS over time. Journeys like debt, journeys like um, we need to get your meter reading, customers would never respond to the letters. You transform them and make them really easy to understand. Suddenly, it's amazing to think, customers actually respond to it when it's really simple. Um, so yeah, completely agree. It's those less sexy journeys. Less sexy is one of our brand values at the writers. That's good. Um, any questions for Harry or for Tina at this point? Oh, loads. OK. Um, one of the things you mentioned is pers um, brand personalities that were that pre-existed before you created this tonality. And in my experience, what I found is if you can 
bring out those personality types that generally allows the tonality to come along with that. So if mm -hmm. it's supposed to be and a jovial, you know, one of the things we tend to be quite an open, happy kind of brand, then the languages that people who understand those and uh, personality types will be able to follow that quite easily as opposed to saying, okay, we need to write in this, this and type. Mm. Yeah. So with you, with British Gas having, as you said, a very number of um, personality types that pre-existed the tonalities that you set down, was there a conflict between the two or were you trying to align them and make it clearer for everyone within the organization? Well, the, the previous personality traits were just sitting there doing nothing. The, the, if you looked at the brand framework... They, they we weren't had, the traits, were they? Eh? That wasn't British Gas's trait. We could sit here and do nothing. <laughs> yeah. Um, like I say, we had about 10 personality traits, and they didn't, they didn't mean enough to so many parts of the business because there was too many of them. There's too many. People can't remember what they are, and they'll not get behind them. So when you've got caring British, helpful leader, and I can't remember the rest, I'll be totally honest, um, we, couldn't, we couldn't have built a tone of voice program around that. We just couldn't have. Like, what, what's your tone of voice for British? Uh, how do you reflect that in, in comms? Um, don't answer that, Neil. Um, <laughs> but what we did was, if we wanted to actually get people to understand what the personality was, then we had to reduce that down. So that's how we got to three. And even then, one of those wasn't perfect for reflecting um, with tone of voice. So... Um, in tune, down to earth, and pioneering. In tune and down to earth were great. So when you say, how do you get um, people to really get the personality? Well, down to earth is a perfect one. That's all about speaking less like a corporate, not like innocent. It's that bit in the middle that just speaks in normal language that the customer can understand. That was about being down to earth, just feeling like a normal, a normal person. Pioneering was much more about the content that we had. So what is the new exciting product that we've got, and how do we talk about that in, a, in that down to earth and in tune way? Um, so yeah, in terms of the new personality traits, it was, it was easy. It was the focal point of the, of the training was to say, this is how we are in tune. This is how we are down to earth. This is how we are pioneering. I couldn't have done that with um, the old personality traits. Just couldn't have run a session. Um, I, I can't even think how we would have brought that to life. Oh yeah, we are helpful. It's just, it doesn't mean anything. It should be a hygiene factor for any company. Half the room has helpful as well. <laughs> and just to Follow-up question to that, and one of the things you mentioned is these personalities that pre-existed you, you weren't able to implement it as a voice of tonality, then you kind of slimmed it down. Um, one of the th as probably prior to you, those who created those personalities, I thought these were the perfect ideal way of kind of managing it. Now you've got three, four. Were you, did you, in a sense, eat your own dog food and try out um, some of these um, tone out, voice of tone that you had in, say, um, writing a letter with the comms team, sitting down with them, the complaints team, and being able to sh make sure, as an example, this is how you do it, so leading by that. Yes, yeah, so that, was, that was the entire process. So all of those old traits was our old tone of voice. That was our old strategy. So that was a very complicated way of writing in a very formal language that didn't make any sense. And this is what I mean about the disconnect. A caring, helpful leader, on the face of it, it sounds pretty straightforward but it wasn't reflected in the comms. That's because we didn't have a tone of voice program. We had a style guide, basically. So looking at the old way versus the new way, that is exactly as I've described. That was our research with customers. That was what we took back to our working group. That's what we got signed off by our marketing director, commercial director. It was very much old versus new, old disconnected way of having a language program, new connected way that all of our customers and our pe internal people are bought into. Um, compare the old versus the new in the new one. He's very Tony Blair once he gets going. Uh, there were a couple more questions at the back. Yeah. Um, it sounded like you ended up creating quite a few guidelines. Uh, in, yeah. in, uh, so how did you make that work in the sense that I find that with too many guidelines, people get confused about which ones they're meant to use and then where they're meant to go to find them and all that kind of stuff. So how did you make them usable so people instantly knew which guidelines to go and they didn't get confused? Um, so the, the tone of voice guidelines document was obviously the master one. I think it came out at about 40 pages, which seems long, but that was quite a visual um, style. Each page would just have you know, one bit of information on it, and then a lot of before and afters in the end that, to be honest, I think people used more than the rest of the guidelines, because that, that really, really helps land the point. Um, the, the more specific individual ones would only be used by that area of the business. So digital had basically a three-page owned slightly honed document that we'd work together with them on. 
Um, that was just for specifics that were missing from the master guidelines document. I didn't want to put digital guidelines into the master guidelines for someone else in the business to then read. So that's how, why we had these slight additions on top. Um, no field due was really for our comms team because um, for new people coming into the business, they wanted to make it a real key part of the induction. Um, and then on top of that, we had a style guide that only copywriters used. So um, all of the training, everything was uh, uh, involved, everything that we'd um, trained the business on was about those master guidelines. Then if we did anything specific, it was just for that area of the business. So we didn't tend to see much complication um, in having so many. I just wondered if either of you had um, experience of attributing sort of a financial benefit to the organisation and how you went about doing this. Yeah, um, so I'm hoping, I don't think you've got it actually, but um, on the debt journey in particular, um, the key part of getting more customers to respond, that's how we get the financial benefit. Problem is British Gas on a three to five year um, regeneration plan of rebuilding reputation and the, the key difference with Tone of Voice is that you will transform a journey and you'll spend a lot of time transforming it. That by the time it's actually landed, it takes a long time for those results, those financial results to come through. I know internally the results were hugely beneficial. Like we, we, as I said, we saved money on um, printing costs, for example, because we, we halved most um, comms that we're sending out. Um, review time, efficiency. Um, <coughs> and then from a customer point of view, the financial um, results we've had, I, I can't, because I've left now, I can't say it for certain, but they will be positive, and I know Neil's had results from other brands in the past. Yeah, I, the one um, that I can talk about is BT, where Harry is now, who we've been working with for a long while. Um, the number that they always hang their hat on, the head of brand language at BT, because they had a, have a head of brand language, is £6 million saving <coughs> over five years. Um, most of which has come through cutting things like call centre scripts, where you can actually measure how long a second of call handling time costs in a call centre. Um, and probably, as is the same case with you guys, the aim of that BT programme was not to save money. Mm. The aim was to do something with the brand. But those other benefits mm. came alongside. I mean, were you necessarily aiming for measurable stuff? No, it, it wasn't. No, we weren't necessarily aiming for measurable stuff. And, and I think for us as well, we, would, we were, because we, we were and are a business in transition, we were doing so many different things at the same time, it would have been quite hard to unpick exactly what did the change in tone of voice drive yeah. financially versus the re-engineered processes that sat behind, you know, yeah. things that were happening. So, I mean, what we do know as an organisation is that we have seen a very steady and a very significant reduction in our complaints mm. over recent years. And, of course, there is a financial benefit associated with that. Um, yes, sorry. No, go on. No, it did, when we focus on NPS as well, um, so if you're focusing on your brand trackers, uh, if you can find a way of attributing <coughs> what that two-point rise over two years is, um, if you can just find out what that financial benefit is, as well as just NPS, that's huge. That's something that really gets your board of directors on board. Unfortunately, as Tina says, you've got so many other factors that go into it. Um, I know that with debt, that is something that we can track over time specifically. Um, some of the other journeys, direct debit transformation, for example, we can track those specifics. But again, behind that is a technological transformation. Um, but you can certainly, you know, do a few of those. Good yes. Stats. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So speaking of pulling out some good stats, um, just so the writer team know, I'm just throwing the agenda out the window at this point because they're answering good questions. So uh, Marianne is just going to briefly talk us uh, through some research which I mentioned at the top that we commissioned into tone of voice in the UK. I am. That's what's going to happen now. Excellent. Um, OK, uh, let's have a look. So this question then, is tone of voice worth the money? Um, well, we do tone of voice, so we obviously have our own opinion about that. Um, so we thought it would be a good idea to get an independent research company involved. So we commissioned Illuma Research to go and talk to some people across the UK. Um, they spoke to 197 people in different businesses around the UK. All of them were involved in verbal or visual identity in some way or another. Um, about half had a tone of voice, half didn't. That is a visual representation of half and half, <laughs> just, uh, just in case any of us were feeling unclear. Um, so that's what these results are based on. So, um, 
what to tell you. Um, so this was the question that we asked them then. This was one of the many questions we asked. Did you get value from your tone of voice? And the results here, I think, are really, really interesting. Um, so most people felt that they got value from tone of voice to a fair extent. But honestly, like honestly, probably not quite as many people as we might have thought were saying we got a really, really great value from tone of voice. Um, so that got us thinking, what is that about? Um, and the answer to that question from the beginning, is tone of voice worth it? We think it's this. We think, yes, obviously, um, if you do it right. Okay, so there are some key things that you can do that will help tone of voice be properly worth the money, be properly good value. Um, and I'm going to share them with you because, you know, it would be a bit rude if, if I didn't, if I stopped there. Um, so I'm going to share with you uh, five things that we think, based on this research, based on everything that we know about doing tone of voice for the last decade or so with businesses around the world. Okay, um, thing number one, get the chief executive involved, get the senior people involved um, and do it as early as you can. So obviously as Tina mentioned, that was great at Santander because they had somebody who was essentially giving them the brief. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes it might be a bit of work for you to do. And um, why is this helpful, important? Well, this, this was a really interesting finding for us from the research. We asked people, what kicked off your tone of voice research? What made it happen? Now, the top result there is all about a rebrand. So you'd expect that, wouldn't you? Of course, if you're rebranding a visual identity, if you're looking at everything, of course you might look at your tone of voice. But we were quite surprised at how high it came out for a new chief executive. Um, and we have, we have some theories on this. We, we think that this is because um, once a chief executive comes in, obviously they're interested in that bit about changing a business, about culture change. Um, and we know that tone of voice and language, from what we've heard here and from what we've experienced ourselves, is one of the really big ways that you can do that. Because not everybody in the business will ever get involved in the precise sizing of a logo, um, but everybody in your business will be writing. So we think that new chief executives, senior people, are generally quite excited by tone of voice. They're likely to, if they're coming in new, they're likely to have seen it in other places as well. Um, those senior people then, they do recognise the value, okay? So they're, they're up for it. So more than 70% are saying that they recognise the value of tone of voice. In fact, 39% say that they are um, engaged with tone of voice to a great extent. Now, it might not seem like that big a number, but if you think about the senior people that you work with, um, how many of them get really excited about brand and marketing projects? Probably all of them all the time, I don't know. <laughs> but we thought like that 39% um, engaged to a great extent for tone of voice was quite an interesting one. Again, people, once people start to see the effects, they really buy into it. So the more you can work with your chief exec, the more you can work with your senior people, we think that really helps um, a tone of voice do its job. Okay. Thing number two, be ambitious. Um, so it's really easy to think about tone of voice as a brand project, as a marketing project. Um, but actually, as we've sort of heard a little bit from our speakers already, um, it, it gets everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Um, so again, more than 90% of the people that we spoke to who had a tone of voice so that it was being used in most or all of the functions in their business. Most or all. Now, that was, that was really interesting for us. There were just a few, there was just a really small minority who said, well, it's only really marketing and comms. Nearly everybody we spoke to said, um, this is getting used across the business. Um, so that was really exciting for us because we kind of think, again, it's that um, brand by stealth bit that you can do really well. Um, is it as important as your visual identity? Now, you know, I think the day is long past where we have to make a case for having a really good visual identity. Tone of voice is, is much newer, I think. Um, it's, it, it's, it's not quite mainstream. It's sort of teetering on the brink of being mainstream. Um, and yet, um, more than 60, 65% of people were saying that it's as important or even in some cases more important than visual identity. So I think it's, it's just back to that point that tone of voice is becoming more and more important for brands, more and more interesting for people as they start to look at how they can shift how people see their business. Okay, spend some money on it. Well, we would say this, wouldn't we? But independent research. Um, we asked people who didn't have a tone of voice already how much they thought it might cost if they were going to develop one. Uh, can, you, can you guess how much they thought? Anyone like to hazard a guess? 10 million. Someone give her a piece of paper. And <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my card. Um, no, okay, so people who didn't have a tone of voice thought it would cost them around £73,000. 
um, people who did have a tone of voice who could actually tell us how much they had spent on it. Um, the average came out as this. That's, that's quite a big number. That's quite a big number. Um, but typically, businesses don't come to, to us or to people like us and say, right, here is £100,016, you know, please create a tone of voice. That's not how it works. It tends to be a project that grows and develops. And as we say, as it gets into other bits of the business, that's where, um, that's where we can kind of see impact across everywhere. So a bit more specifically, we looked at different sectors and how much they were spending. Perhaps unsurprisingly with that um, FS out up there in front leading the way, spending around 146k on their tone of voice. Um, telecom's not too far behind. Again, these findings are probably fairly intuitive. If you're in a crowded market, if your marketing products and services are quite intangible, quite difficult to see and grasp, it's not surprising that you need to invest a bit more in brand and invest a bit more in tone of voice. Um, these were the reasons that we asked, you know, why, why did you actually do this? Um, and that kind of relevant customer comms, like getting your message across to customers at every bit of the journey. Um, and then again, that bit that's about differentiating yourself from other businesses. So those were the top two reasons. With that in mind, I don't think it's too surprising that FS, telecoms, energy, utilities are the kind of businesses that are spending the most. Okay, uh, thing number four, review it. <laughs> Again, it feels like a bit of a no-brainer, and yet it's really funny, isn't it? It's like, well, we've got our tone of voice. Yep, yep, we've got our tone of voice. Yep, it's in our brand book. Yep, it's really good. We really like it. Um, ten years go by, the world changes, and we're still saying the same things. Um, so when we asked people who had a tone of voice, would you do it again? Pretty much all of them said that they would. They, they would definitely or probably be doing their tone of voice again. We asked them how often they thought they would need to refresh it. Um, and the number that kind of kept coming back to us, and this is true for people who didn't have a tone of voice as well, actually. They were saying the same thing. They all reckoned about every five years was about the right amount of time, which, which figures, I think, because, you know, the, the pace of change that we're seeing in markets, it's not surprising that you need to come back to it. Um, and I think we talked a little bit about that idea that maybe you have a, a kind of reasonably short-term tone of voice. You have the tone of voice that gets you from one place to another, that moves you into being perhaps a bit more human. After five years, you can afford to be a bit more aspirational. You can afford to do slightly different things with it. Um, so I think that's, that's a really interesting one, making sure that you keep an eye on what's happening and keeping an eye on your competitors as well and how things are looking and sounding in the market. Okay, thing number five. Um, so the writer, a tone of voice agency, is recommending that you use a specialist tone of voice agency. I know, I know, I know. Um, but look, this is what happened. When we asked people, who, if you were going to do your tone of voice again, who would you use? And the only number that went up was for the people um, who looked at specialist tone of voice agency. <sighs> Why is that? Why is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, is it just because we're brilliant? Um, well, we, we think it's this. We think that if you think about tone of voice as a program, as a project, as a way of creating culture change, it's probably not surprising that having people who are specialists will help you. Um, a thing that we've touched on this already, a thing that often happens for us is that people ring us up and they say, look, we've got a tone of voice. It's two pages in a brand book. No one's using it. No one cares. What do we do? <laughs> um, and we're the people who are probably quite good at coming in and, and helping you sort that out. Because we see lots of, lots of tone of voice materials that say things like, be bold, but not arrogant. Be friendly, but not patronizing. And all these ideas are probably great ideas and very helpful and very in tune with your brand. But when you go and sit down at your computer to write your board report or whatever, and you're, you know, you're inwardly thinking, I need to be bold, but not arrogant. And I need to be friendly, but you know, it can be a bit tricky. It can, be a bit, it can be a bit tricky. There can be a lot going on. So how do you make it really practical? How do you make it stick? I think that's the bit that we're probably the most interested and excited about when it comes to thinking about tone of voice. Okay, what's my next slide? Um, so, yeah, this came out. We did a little bit of qualitative research alongside. Got that word. Good. Um, alongside. And uh, we asked some people what they, what they thought about it. And I think this just backs it up. Um, you know, we've, we've, people have get their tone of voice projects, but it, it can be hard to make it land unless you spend a bit of time, a bit of money, um, a bit of effort, really, getting people around the business enthused and excited. OK, I think that's the end of my presentation until, for now. <laughs> Dramatic ending. Dramatic Thanks ending. Right. Lovely. Great. So, folks, we were going to break out into little groups, but time is against us. So you might have to improvise your breakout group once we've finished. 
Uh, but we've got, I would say, seven or eight minutes left if there are more questions for Tina, Harry, or indeed Marianne, if you want to. Yeah, there's a couple more. Couple and make them difficult. <laughs> Um, one of the points you made, Marianne, was around um, why people need a tone of voice, and one is around communicating better with customers, yeah. and the other was differentiating the brand yeah. in a crowded marketplace. How much do you think that works when it is that crowded, when you're, say, a British gas and you're trying to differentiate yourself? Uh, what, what do you think the success is like? That's a good question, I guess. So some of it is around... Um, I suppose some of it's around getting the basics right. So it's, it's very easy to say, oh, well, you know, doing the basics feels a bit simplistic. But actually, if you look at a lot of the businesses out there in a market like energy, it's almost uniformly bad. And maybe there'll be like a few challenger brands who are doing it a little bit better above the line. But even their customer comms are probably still quite bad. Um, so some of it's around getting to the point where it, it, it's just decent. Um, I think... Once you're there, it becomes easier to build on that and look at how you can actually differentiate and look at what you can do with taking your tone of voice ideas and maybe taking them into the world of advertising, into the world of marketing, taking them above the line. Would you want to look at Harry here or look at Neil? Yeah, I mean, honestly, one of the things that we face is sometimes clients come to us and say, we want this really distinctive tone of voice. And we say, well, you know, tell us about your brand or your culture or how your business works and they tell us exactly what their competitor told us the week before. So your tone of voice, in a sense, can only be as distinctive as your business is. Otherwise, it's just slapping something on and, and hoping it's true. Um, so I think Marianne's right. It depends on what point you're at. Do you, do you need to sound just easier to deal with, or have you got something genuine that you can hang your hat on? Yeah, and, and for us, um, it, was, it was part of a complete brand transformation. So what... Tone of voice was, you know, it was key. It was the face of our brand. We wanted to reflect it right through the line, the entire customer experience and employee experience. Um, but that doesn't mean that we discounted what the rest of our brand should be. So um, instead of just using cartoons to illustrate all of our products, we started introducing photography in the tone of voice, reflected that photography. It was in tune, it was down to earth. Um, and tone of voice was the leader. It was the one that was always in front that every other aspect of the brand strategy was always trying to catch up with because it was doing so well. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely facilitated a way for us to stand out. A good example is, and it's in our guidelines, is if we listed out all one statement from each of the energy companies, which was um, something to do with sustainability, but the line from British Gas was something like, we are committed to um, uh, being sustainable for our customers. And then the same line was repeated about five times for every other energy company, exactly the same, apart from one who said we are committed to trying. Um, so it's like, are, are you committed to trying? Are you gonna do it? Or are you just gonna think about doing it? Um, so if you, can, if you can change your tone of voice, if you can change your positioning there, just something just a bit simpler like, we are going to be sustainable and actually be a bit more confident with your words. And being confident was one of our principles. It was telling people to stop, stop bullshitting the customer and actually just be clearer in what you're going to do. That allows you to stand out massively, just that one simple change. Question at the back. Oh, just wait for the mic to find its way to you. Oops. Do you want to pass it along? I think she's got a question. Oh, sorry, you've got a question as well. Sorry. So, hi, thank you very much for a good morning session. Uh, I have a question. If you're running like a global company, you got the challenges with not only different languages, but also different cultures, and, and the essence of your brand might come across, you know, different across uh, regions. Do you have any experience in that? And if so, uh, do you have any tips you could share with us? Well, Tina, I'm sort of looking at you because Simple Personal Fair has gone global, hasn't it? It's going global. Okay. Yeah, I, yes. <laughs> yes, it has. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I can provide you an answer which is one lens on it because whilst I work for what is um, a company that has presence in 10 different international markets, I work in the UK. Um, having said that, um, we are at Santander in the process of rolling out the principles of being simple personal fare across all of the different markets. And I've had a few opportunities to talk to some of the, the, the people in those different markets about how that's going, how people are responding. And, um, and what's been really interesting is that fare in 
in different languages means very different things. Um, and in some, in some cultures, it's, it's really relevant and really motivating, and in others, it's less relevant and motivating. And, and of course, you've got, um, we've got Santander working in markets of different maturities. So, you know, Spain, uh, it's, it's, there's presence in Spain and, and, and Europe, there's presence in uh, South America and North America, and, you know, South America and North America couldn't be more different. Um, so what the guys are doing is thinking about, you, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to go back to your audience and to your consumers and understand what's motivating for them in the context of what you're trying to achieve. And for them, they might dial bits up. And, you know, in some markets, it might be more around being simple and personal and, and the, the fair bit might be less relevant. Um, but you can still achieve some, some global consistency. The, the language piece is really interesting. And I um, worked with a colleague who, when we shared the, the language work we'd done and the tone of voice work we'd done with him, he was off to undertake a global role. And he, he skipped off with it under his arm saying, this is brilliant. This is, you know, I'm going to go and share this with, with all of the other markets and see where they get to. Um, and, and I haven't seen that work yet and seen where they get to. Of course, if they write it all in Spanish, I'm not going to understand it anyway. Mm. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a big challenge for organisations. I think on the language point, one thing we see at The Writer, because we do work with lots of those global clients, is our speakers have kind of talked about two levels of stuff, really, where there's sort of the spirit of it, and then there's the practical, how do you actually make that happen bit. And I think what tends to happen is you can keep that spirit pretty much consistent in different places, but you just have to accept that practi practically how you create a particular feeling or a particular personality in Mandarin is going to be different to how you do it in English or German or Spanish or whatever. Any more, anything you, you can talk about Geordie versus London? <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, qualitative re sorry. You mentioned doing um, qualitative research as part of um, you kind of rolling out your tone of voice to the business. Um, can you tell me who you used exactly? Just because I, I, I'm always interested in sort of recommendations of uh, who's good at actually testing things like tone of voice um, uh, in a kind of useful, meaningful way, but also maybe touch on kind of what exactly that involved because you mentioned sort of before and after examples of tone but but yeah um just sort of who you use would be good and also just a little bit more about how you actually tested the tone so um who you tested it on how big the groups were how subjective it was or how much you could kind of objectify it um does that does that make sense a question. yeah it does make sense um i would be very happy to tell you who did it if i could remember <laughs> <laughs> um so i may have to uh, feed that back yep. some some other way to four years work when i find out we, we actually managed the work that we did through um we have a program of research which we call treating customers fairly tcf is a key principle in financial services um, and so we, we have ongoing and ongoing research activity every quarter that allows us to test all sorts of different communications that we're producing to make sure that we absolutely are writing in a way that allows us to be confident that we are treating our customers fairly. Um, so it, it was as simple and it, it was very similar actually to, to the, the approach that Harry took. Away. Actually what we did, we went into the organisation and we just found lots of different examples of communications, whether they were for retail audiences or some of our business audiences or corporate audiences. Um, those were the communications. We then worked with the teams to rewrite them to adopt the new tone of voice and literally took those into qualitative research groups with the right audiences. So we only spoke about a credit limit increase letter, for example, with a population of customers that were likely to be interested in talking to us about a letter about credit cards. Um, <clears throat> and the, we, we did it two ways, basically, um, with, those, with, with, with the target groups. We gave them the old version, half of the group, we gave them the old version of the letter first and just asked for their feedback on it, and then showed them the new one to see what their opinion was. And, and for the other half of the group, we did it the other way around, um, just because we wanted to make sure that we weren't creating any um, unintentional research effects, um, and asked them to tease out what they liked about each letter, what they didn't like about each letter. Um, and, that, and that was really useful. And, and, and it did teach us some things, because there were bits where, where actually the way that it had been done previously, which we'd changed, they'd said, well, actually, I quite like getting that information. We're like, OK, well, that's really important. You know, that's really important to you, then it needs to stay in. Um, 
but, but, but we were, as I said earlier, we were very relieved that the, the new letters were significantly better received than the old letters. And, and, and the key difference was, you know, all the things we've already talked about. They were universally shorter. The main point was always first in the new letters. You know, we broke things up so that there were clear subheads so that people could navigate quickly through the letter. And, I mean, we all know what it's like. You get to the end of the day, you go home, you've had a busy day, your post has arrived, you tear it open, and the letter that is, like, two solid pages, you sort of go... And I do. I put it down on the worktop. I'll, I'll read it later. And later never quite happens, does it? You know, whereas the letter that has been nice and clear and succinct, even if I haven't read it very clearly. I've read the subhead, so I know broadly what it's about, so I know now this is really important to me and I've got to go back to read it. Whereas the other one, I never really knew what it was about anyway, so I don't know whether it was important. And that's why you don't get a response from the customer, yeah. which no one could ever figure out. <laughs> um, just, just quickly, the research we did was a company called Sparkler. Um, and what we did was, uh, after the working day, so I think we started the research at about 6 o'clock and it ran till about 11, um, we brought in customer groups, we got them excited, we got them, well, as excited as you can be. Um, <laughs> we, we got them in the room, we got them warmed up, and then we sat down with them, and we, we um, I think we had people from British Gas and people from the writer in each room, um, just asking them about humanising the British Gas brand, uh, as I've said, um, and then we just took them through the journey of, um, this is our brand personality, what do you think? Um, and then showed them the before and afters, and we just had a discussion each time. Standard with it being British Gas, you got some people in the room who just wanted to vent about British Gas in general. <laughs> but luckily, they seem quite receptive to the tone of voice, so the little wins matter. I'm going to take one more speedy question, if anyone's got a pithy one. Yes, sir. <clears throat> hey, I was just wondering if you had any clashes with your legal compliance teams <laughs> who may be overcautious. This is always an interesting one, because... <laughs> The people who first spoke to the writer at British Gas, long before the brand team, was our legal team, um, who got in touch to get some help with the terms and conditions. And that's when we found out about it and got on, um, cottoned onto it. And it was, obviously, we were doing this brand strategy work at the same time. Um, the legal team, you will get some skeptics, um, but that is often around terminology, specific words that... Um, we feel aren't needed. We can say the exact same thing, but in a slightly different way. But there are some terms that we have to use, um, industry standard terms that uh, the regulator won't let us change. But for us, legal, we're completely bought into it. We had really frank discussions with them. Um, we had really great training workshops with them, and we handled any objections. And I'd say it might be different in other organisations, but our legal team were kind of almost champions and ambassadors. And I think that's just because of the state of some of the T's and C's that we had at PG. They were not in a good place. You could clean them up, put them in some... Um, the, the normal versus formal thing got quite interesting here. You didn't have to completely um, make your terms and conditions really colloquial all of a sudden. It was just all about structure. It was about cutting um, words and sentences and phrases that weren't needed. And it was just all about making it clearer. And for the legal team, you know, if they... The sitting reviewing um, clause after clause every day on, on our marketing comms. If you can make that easier for them to do and easier to follow and easier to read, they have no objection. It, it makes their job easier and it makes the job easier for the customer. And to speak up for legal people, they usually care about language. Yeah. You know, they are interested in it. So once you get them hooked, you can usually persuade them. Oh, the best advice I would give you is, is involve them right from the very start. Yeah. Don't spring anything on your legal and compliance team later. Get them involved <laughs> at the start. We had no issues at all. Mm. On that utopian note, uh, I think we should stop. So um, come outside, grab a coffee, harangue our speakers more if you want to. Um, finally, the only thing for me to say is thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, We'll probably be sending you an invitation to a LinkedIn group because we're trying to create the world of people who are interested in this stuff. You never know, we might even meet face to face again and suss out what some of your problems are and see if we can help each other. Um, you might also get a link to our podcast which is coming up, which is a similar-ish conversation with the guy I mentioned earlier, John Hawkins of BT, who works with Harry think is the only head of brand language in the UK, unless any of you are going to argue with us. Um, 
so yeah, listen to all that stuff. And finally, most importantly, thank you, Marianne, and Harry, and Tina.